Hello there, I'm Janie Goddard, I'm president of the Complementary Medical Association and I'm joined today by Professor William Stevens from Creighton University and I would love to just put, just turn things over to Professor Stevens and just say would you kindly introduce yourself to our viewers and tell us a little bit about your work if you don't mind. Happy to Janie, happy to be with you. Uh, I'm a professor of philosophy at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, as you mentioned. I've been there for 30 years now, um, and I specialize in ancient Greek and Roman philosophy. My research specialty is in the Hellenistic period, which includes ancient Stoicism, but I also do work in ethics, ethics in animals, and environmental ethics. So I've been working in all of those areas for three decades now at Creighton. Wonderful, thank you very, very much. So I expect the viewers are probably thinking, so what does this ancient Hellenic um, viewpoint actually contribute to us in this day and era of the COVID-19 challenge? I hate to use the word crisis because I don't buy into alarmist language. So we're facing this extraordinary challenge at the moment, and um, all of us globally. So what information can we take from your work and your work particularly on stoicism that I was reading up on earlier on today. How does that translate into something that can help us at this particular time in history? Excellent question and I, I, I it was also excellent the way that you that you phrased it and you immediately rephrased it not as a crisis but as a challenge and in fact that kind of very deliberate and mindful narrative in describing what we're dealing with is precisely the sort of mental therapy and careful rational thinking that the Stoics had taught for a very long time, right? Um, the way that we use our language to describe a situation has a huge impact on our emotional response to it and the way that we, the way that we respond and think in terms of what resources are gonna be available to us, whether we choose to think of ourselves as victimized, this is very disempowering, but if we recognize that we have these intellectual resources to cope with the situation, to work together and cooperate, and to be smart, or as the Stoics would say, to be wise, right? Wisdom is gonna guide us through these challenges, and that's exactly the right way to describe it. So, one of the things that draws me to ancient philosophy in general and to Stoicism in particular is exactly their emphasis on philosophy in practice, philosophy as we live it in our lives. And that was their understanding of what philosophy as the love of wisdom was meant to do. It was to help us live good lives, help us improve how we go about encountering and responding to everything that happens, all the events that a human being faces in life. And so these conceptual resources that the Stoics offer us are as valuable now as they've ever been. But one point I would like to emphasize is Stoicism is not only very useful as a kind of cognitive therapy or intellectual therapy for dealing with challenging situations, but even when things are going well, we might be tempted to think that more is under our control than is actually under our control. And this distinction between what is up to us and what's not up to us is fundamentally Stoic, fundamentally Stoic. The Stoics teach us that we must focus our energies and our attention and our time and efforts on what's completely up to us and accept everything else. Accept everything else that's not up to us and respond to it. Our responses, our actions, our beliefs, our decisions, our choices of how to communicate with each other, attempt to help each other, all of these things are entirely up to us and we're responsible for that. But nobody controls this nasty little virus that has no intention it's not even alive, it's just floating around the world and it's creating serious challenges to human beings. 
Exactly. So essentially, um, what it seems to me, I've, I've got two questions for you, actually. Uh, the, the second question, I'll just sort of flag up so we can come back to it, is that stoicism is very much a buzzword of the moment. It's been popularized by certain sort of YouTubers and so on. So I want to come up back and get your opinion on that in a moment. But what you were saying just then, it really puts me in mind of um, something I was reading and, and uh, something that cropped up for me today, which was a a, a uh, quote from Viktor Frankl where he was talking about one's the only freedom and I'm paraphrasing here but the only freedom that we truly have is the ability to choose and one can extrapolate from that that we are choosing our response to any particular stimulus or in this case stress or of that factor that moves us outside our comfort zone pretty dramatically at the moment um, what's your take on on that Yes, that, that's uh, the, the Frankel, uh, Frankel's idea, again, is straight out of ancient Stoicism, right? Mm. This is what Epictetus and Seneca emphasize, right? Um, our, our choices, but also our beliefs, right? So, so when, when we're our, our sensory stimuli, we perceive them, these things are not under our control, <clears throat> but how we interpret them, right? How, how we choose to value them, the things that we choose to value as good, bad, or neutral, or indifferent, as the Stoics would say. That's up to us. So we would say today our values are up to us, right? And the Stoics' definition of the goal that all human beings strive for is living in agreement with nature. So Stoicism emphasizes this kind of naturalism. Now, what does that mean for them? Well, to unpack that, part of what it means is living in agreement with our human nature. And for the Stoics, what we're particularly good at, capable of, although not always practicing consistent, consistently, is thinking rationally, problem solving, responding with intelligence to our stimuli, to events that occur to us, right? So living in agreement with nature for them means living in agreement with reason. And reason as a capacity is something that we have to practice. We have to train ourselves to make it better. It's like muscle. Right? The more you exercise it, the stronger you're, you're going to get with it. And so if we practice rational responses, rational problem solving, having defensible de beliefs based in what? Based in knowledge. That is based in science. Right? Mm -hmm. Then over time, we can perfect our faculty of reason into what they call virtue. And these virtues are wisdom justice, courage, temperance, generosity, and so forth. So another aspect of our nature is our sociality, right? We associate with others of our species, right? And so a number of Stoke thinkers emphasize the organic connection that we as individual parts have with the whole of humanity, all of the communities and associations that we participate in. And so the emphasis there is on what's good for the whole and not just for the part. This idea really kind of conflicts with much of Western democratic thinking that emphasizes individualism, right? Individual rights, individual freedom. And it's that trade-off in our democratic societies where we're having a little push and pull now because in order to do what's good for the whole, we need to be doing what? Listening to the scientific experts, recognizing their wisdom and conforming our behavior to 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 obey right basically to to accept it right to conform our behavior to what's wise and what's wise now of course as we know is physical distancing right mm -hmm. so it's wonderful that we can network like this but of course the physical distancing the washing of the hands wearing the masks in public all of these things following their guidance is simply the wise and prudent thing to do, which is what Stoicism would emphasize is vital for us, both now and always. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And so to take that on further to uh, that second part of the question, which was uh, the idea that, so, that, that Stoicism has become this kind of uh, uh, life hacker buzzword thing yes. at the moment. A lot of those guys, uh, the dudes, the young dudes are talking about uh, stoicism yeah. saying this is what you got to do. 
And the thing is, to me, uh, William, is that it comes across as being very sort of uh, kind of macho, the way that they're putting it across. It's kind of, you know, uh, this is part of my startup routine. I get up at four o'clock in the morning and I do my press ups and I do my meditation. And I do my, my Wim Hof cold showers and so on and so forth. And, um, and I really wondered whether stoicism is that sort of toughness and I understand toughness and grit of mind which I think is a very good quality to cultivate um, however this sort of machismo that's coming across at the moment how do you feel about that where do you stand on it yeah this is this 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 is indicative of the one aspect one very popular aspect of the popularization of stoicism in the last 10 15 20 years uh, old philosophy professors like myself have been teaching this stuff for much longer than that. Yes. And, you know, we read the primary sources. We read our Seneca, our Epictetus, um, Eusonius Rufus, and Marcus Aurelius. I've written books on, on Marcus and Epictetus myself. And so I understand why young single guys in their 20s, this notion of stoicism as toughening you up and maybe helping you get fit and get in control of your life. Um, it's gonna be appealing, but there is the danger that it does distort the Stoic doctrines that do emphasize, as I said, our social connection and our relationships with other people, right? It's not about rugged individualism, going it on your own and just ignoring other people as you as you wear an armor to create a shell of control around your life that makes you impervious to bad things happening, that's a distortion because there are going to be challenges that everybody faces, whether it's illness, disease, right, uh, uh, death or illness in one, one's family, losing one's job, being laid off, having difficulty and challenges with coworkers or with your children or even your spouse, right? So Stoicism emphasizes, again, this, this tight interconnection with other people. We have a number of different relationships that we participate in all the time, overlapping, overlapping spheres of interaction with our friends, family, coworkers, our neighbors, fellow citizens, and so forth. And again, Stoicism emphasizes that we have complete responsibility over what we bring to each of these relationships. And so right now, we've got to be good team players. We have to protect our neighbors by wearing masks mm -hmm. when we're not gonna be able to social distance when we go outside and we go to stores and so forth. We have responsibilities to them, right? So th there, there is this notion of emotional that Stoics cultivate. They also talk about this concept of self-sufficiency emotional self-sufficiency, but at the same time, although those are goals to try to achieve, it's also the case that Stoics absolutely emphasize our social interconnectedness and our responsibilities to each other, because human beings, if we are to thrive, live in community. We are not loners. We cannot flourish as rational, wise, just beings in isolation for each other, which is one reason why the physical distancing is such a challenge to us because it runs so contrary to our human impulse to congregate, to get together with people, right? So we have to use our intelligence, our reason, to cope with our social needs and fulfill those social responsibilities, familial responsibilities, while at the same time being smart when it comes to medically flattening the curve, right? Not letting the virus do as much damage as it possibly could, but trying to mitigate the best we can. Yes, you're absolutely right. And uh, I think it's interesting. Again, I was uh, reading something else earlier today, and it was some, somebody that came up with a wonderful uh, uh, piece just by saying uh, that we shouldn't, we've got to what, again, come back, coming back to what we were saying earlier, watch, watch our language we mustn't socially isolate. We can socially and physically distance, but we mustn't socially isolate. Absolutely. And that definitely chimes with, with what you're just uh, touching on there, actually, I think. Yes, yes. Yes. So during, I mean, if I, it, the personal example, my mother, I'm in Arizona now on sabbatical, as you mentioned, my mother is back in Indiana and she's in a retirement home. 
And so she's basically locked down for the, for the safety of all of the residents. Well, I mean, the last couple of weeks, I've been calling her every other day, right? Because I can do that. I mean, imagine, and, and, and again, this has to do with recognizing our resources. Imagine how in 1918, during the Spanish flu, people dealt with that epidemic, that pandemic, without any of the technological tools that we have at our disposal now, with telephones, with the internet, right? We have much more powerful means of connecting socially, as you were saying, now. And so we really should be grateful for that. That technology is helping us cope with this tremendous challenge in the pandemic, and it is a challenge. But one other thing that, that Stoics would remind us is that this is the sort of thing that we should anticipate every day. This is hardly the first pandemic that humanity has faced, right? In ancient Rome, Marcus Aurelius dealt with the, what was, what's been called the Antonine Plague. Mm -hmm. and Historians disagree. They think that maybe it was measles. Others think it might, might have been smallpox, but it decimated the Roman Empire during Marcus's day. Well, you know, this sort of thing can happen, right? So we have to be prepared for these sorts of challenges. They're going to come around again. And we have to learn from the strategies that we've employed this time around to try to do better the next time anticipating that these things can happen nothing should take us you know uh, by surprise now right we, mm -hmm. we we know that this sort of thing could happen does happen so let's let's roll up our sleeves and help each other deal with it well you're absolutely right and in fact i think these scientists have really been using the buzzword uh, well the buzz phrase for quite some time, which is as regards, um, you know, viral pandemic, it's not a matter of if, but when. Exactly. So we know, I mean, I, I've written two books on pandemic flu. Uh, the first one was on bird flu, the second was on uh, H1N1 swine flu. And again, looking back a lot at the, at what happened back in uh, 1918 and, uh, and you know, the, the so-called Spanish flu. Um, and you're absolutely right. I think on one hand, people didn't have the the luxury of the communications that we have nowadays which i mean thank goodness you know that we do have all of this but also the flip side of that is that they don't have or, or they didn't have all of the alarmist um information and i know a lot of people out there are binging on the news and the news is very very alarmist um i for example i spend a lot of time in the usa and uh, i do notice a difference in the quality of reporting in so far as uh, very much with the bbc it's very much sort of fact 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 um yes. and very little emotion whereas what i've noticed in the states um is that there's a lot of emotional uh, reporting a lot yes. of reporting designed to provoke a response and which of course because these are commercial channels is really driving the stickability of these news channels you know keeping people hooked um, to to what's whatever catastrophe is is happening next so i think there's a lot um, to be said for avoiding uh news um back in 19 of, 1918 of course it was the end of the war to end all wars so they had that massive um psychological and physical burden of stressors upon them so it was no wonder that uh h1n1 de decimated uh, they say 50 million people maybe more um right. i don't and i think because of our response nowadays and because of the very smart advice from the powers that be um isolating and having washing and 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 down to flatten the curve very very sensible but my feeling is and I, I think I would totally agree with you it's really a case of this is something that's happened it's likely to happen again the COVID uh, viruses mutate that's what they do as we all yeah. know so that will there'll be another one uh, we don't know when I mean it, but it, it'll happen uh, it may be in our lifetimes it may happen several times in our lifetimes it may not happen in our lifetimes but you know this is something that we are going to have to really think about and uh, also I think it, it kind of um, 
repositions our thinking around uh, the ethics of um, animals in markets and uh, and so on. Yes. And that you write and, and do a lot of work around um, animal ethics, and I was just yeah. curious as to your position on on that with a view to relate uh, in relationship to COVID. Oh yes, well I, I, I've been writing on that recently and 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 often in the past. Yeah, I, I'm hoping that and, and this. Again, I, I agree with you, your distinction between the sort of fact-based news and the kind of, you know, let, let's call it what it is. It's, it's often an appeal to propaganda. There's, there's, yes. there's, a, there's a, a profession of, you know, certain political spin, a certain point of view. And I, I've noticed the difference, too, because I, when I traveled to, to England and, and enjoyed the, the BBC, uh, and Gogglebox, this is one of my entertainments that I like very much. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but I think, I mean, I think it's fair to say that I mean, a stoic response to propaganda and to, to you know, heavily politically slanted reporting uh, or news is, again, you cannot seed your own rational faculties. You have to maintain your own critical thinking and evaluating what you're hearing, what the source is, does it square with other sources? Mm -hmm. you, 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 can't, you can't just give that up and just absorb everything that comes at you because as you pointed out, often it's very conflicting and some of it doesn't really have any regard for the truth, especially in the United States these days. There's a danger from, from some of our political leaders to play fast and loose with the facts. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really taken a toll because there are a number of of people who unfortunately are more gullible because of their own political interests and affiliations that uh, yeah. they're, they're, they're vulnerable to that. And, and so it's, it's a kind of manipulation. So you have to be smart and take responsibility for your own belief formation. Regarding animals, yes, I mean, I, I'm, uh, I, we haven't, I have not seen in the news really much discussion of that at all yet, but I do hope that after we get on the downside of the curve, we can have that conversation. Some in the animal welfare community have said that this is absolutely the time to recognize that our relationship with any number of non-human animal species needs to be scrutinized much more closely. One huge difference that we face now compared to uh, those in, in 1918 is that of course, there are far, far more human beings alive today on the planet than the planet Earth has ever seen throughout its entire history. Far more human beings and population growth continues to go up and up and up. And this multiplied times are uh, multiplied by our consumptive practices, our habitual practices when it comes to taking resources from the planet, pollution and so forth, global climate change. We really do need to scrutinize very closely our relationship with other animal species and see the kinds of problems and exploitations that were ingredient to this situation which we're now having to face. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And uh, I'm just hoping this is going to be a wake up call and that we can sit back and have an intelligent discussion about this element of, of the problem. And also, of course, general ecology moving forward from here. So yes, thank yes. you for that. I really appreciate your perspective on, on that. So um, in closing, uh, can I just ask you if there are any resources that people can call upon to uh, cr improve their resilience, perhaps from the Stoic perspective? Um, are there any books they should be reading or any practices that they should be doing that could possibly help them out at this time? Yes, there, there are several very good online resources on modern Stoicism. One of them is modernstoicism.com. Um, the Daily Stoic and other, there's an international society of, of uh, Stoic practitioners. So you can, you can do web searches and find these groups and you can exchange uh, emails and comments online. But of course, my, my favorites are to read the ancient Stoics themselves. So get your good translation of Epictetus's discourses, Epictetus's handbook, Seneca's letters and moral essays are wonderful, and Marcus Aurelius really very useful and consoling in this time, helping us 
be meditative at the end of the day, reviewing as the Stoics offered as a kind of rational therapy, review your behavior during the day before you go to sleep at night. What things did you do well? What things did you not do well? Own both of them, right? And think about how you can do better the next day, keeping in contact with other people. And there are very good books written on, uh, on the Stoics, on the Stoic philosophers. Uh, I, I recently gotten emails from, from people that I'd never met before who thanked me for my book on Marcus Aurelius and on Epictetus. So that's always very heartening. But in addition to my own books, there are some also very good books written by, by professors who dev devoted their scholarly life to Stoicism. Those are well worth reading as well. That's absolutely wonderful. Thank you. And just so that the viewers know, we will put all of that information under the uh, under this video on under the show notes. So uh, for the viewers, if you can press, there's a little arrow at the side of the video just underneath it. Um, actually, it'll be on this side for you. And uh, if you click on that, it will drop down and you'll be able to see all of the show notes and we'll put all the links in there for you. So uh, that will take you directly to the source. Um, so Excellent. thank you. Uh, thank you. So so, so much. Uh, in closing, I just want to thank you for your time. It was very, very quick um, that we were able to set this up and I just can't believe how wonderful it's been and how incredibly helpful. So I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you, Janie. Very much enjoyed it. Oh, it's, uh, me too. Thank you. All the best. And uh, I shall uh, talk to you soon, no doubt. Very good. Thank you.